Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. It's my blessing and privilege to be here and to continue our reading and discussion of this most wonderful Protestant work entitled Rome and Civil Liberty by James Aitken Wiley. It is a consummate warning to Great Britain of the rise of the global Vatican. Whether James A. Wiley knew it or not, his voice is heard even today with the same warning, the rise of the global Vatican. Now, he didn't describe it in these terms, but they are true nonetheless to describe what he's saying. James Aiken Wiley is talking about the New World Order. Many claim that the New World Order, as we view it here at Inquisition Update today, existed even during the time of James A. Wiley, and he didn't fully comprehend it. But that doesn't nullify the warnings that James A. Wiley is giving. They're appropriate and timely and timeless. Okay, The rise of Antichrist began with when Antichrist first entered on the world scene. That is the creation of the first bishopric of Rome. It was the papacy that replaced the restrainer. The restraining power was the Roman Caesar of the pagan Roman, Roman Empire. And when the Caesars ceased to exist, or rather displaced their center of power from Rome to Constantinople, the Bishop of Rome stood up in his place. And Rome, for at the time of the writing of this book, nearly 1,500 years, ruled all of Europe with a rod of iron. He ruled over the kings of the earth. Now, at the time of the Protestant Reformation, that power ceased, at least for a time. But now it is rebuilt again in the world. This is the building of the hierarchy in Great Britain that James A. Wiley is warning about. And through this organism called the dioceses, and through the power of the Pope, Roman Catholicism, by Roman Catholic canon law, is, being re is replacing the Protestant government of Great Britain. The object is to replace the body of law and the body of order in England with Roman Catholic canon law and the Pope to replace the Queen and the Parliament and the Constitution with the Pope and Roman Catholic canon law. That is the global Vatican. Rome won't cease until Protestant Great Britain is, de is, is destroyed and Protestant America is destroyed until the whole world is fashioned after the likeness and according to the laws of canon law. That's the New World Order. It's not new at all. It's simply the reconstruction of the Old World Order. Now, we're going to talk specifically about canon law, retreating just to the top of the paragraph that we began yesterday on page 76, if you're following along online. It's entitled, Canon Law versus British Law, or a Battle for Magna Carta. The author James A. Wiley says, Canon law then bears on its front a claim in the Pope's behalf of a supreme, a universal, and a divine sovereignty. This sovereignty embraces both the spiritual and the temporal jurisdictions. To be sure, there is a distinction here in law, but not in fact. A distinction all but unknown to canon law, though maintained by modern canonists between the spiritual and temporal jurisdictions, which go to make up the one supreme, irresponsible, that is, responsible to no one, and infallible sovereignty of the pontiff, of which it is but fair to give our opponents the benefit. Okay, Just trust them when they tell you, because that's what they mean. Canon law is the law of God, according to the papist, according to the papacy. 
Okay, it is supreme. It is irresponsible. It ju- it it answers to no one. It is autonomous. It is totally immune from human influence. <clears throat> it is divine and infallible. And its administrator is the Pope, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And his jurisdiction is the whole earth. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. You see how he takes on the likeness of God himself? And for those who believe that he is God or the vicar of God, the replacement of God on earth, they obey him as if he were God. And they have a spiritual and moral mandate to extend the papacy's sovereignty and jurisdiction all over this world until it completely encompasses it. Not a, not a dot of the world is to be immune from papal law. Just as if it were God on earth reigning. Now he continues, he says, to be sure there is a, distinct, a distinction here in law, but not in fact. A, distinguish, a distinction all but unknown to canon law, though maintained by modern canonists, between the spiritual and temporal jurisdictions <clears throat> which go to make up the one supreme, irresponsible, and infallible sovereignty of the pontiff, of which it is but fair to give our opponents the benefit. His spiritual jurisdiction he possesses and exercises, say such, directly. His temporal jurisdiction he possesses and exercises indirectly. Okay, We described that yesterday as his direct uh, influence and jurisdiction over the spiritual uh, through the form of papal bulls, encyclicals, pastoral letters, and other issuances from the throne in Rome. But his temporal jurisdiction and his power in the temporal is, is exercised by the civil government. Okay? So his temporal power is made real in the world indirectly through the civil governments of the world. So this is the very essence of Roman canon, canon, Roman Catholic canon law, which says that the Pope rules over the kings and the governments of the world because they are required to do his bidding in the temporal realm. Now, but even these writers admit that the pontiff's supreme spiritual power extends to all temporal matters which involve duty. And as there is no matter in which duty is not involved, so there is no matter into which the pontiff's power does not penetrate, and which falls not within his indirect temporal jurisdiction. The Pope then, according to Roman Catholic canon law, and even according to the admission of recent jurists, Roman Catholic canonists, is the temporal as well as spiritual chief of the world. Okay, here's your global Vatican. Let me read it again. The Pope then, according to canon law, and even according to the admission, the admission of recent jurists, that is, Roman Catholic canon lawyers, is the temporal as well as the spiritual chief of the world. So Rome's jurists, Rome's canon lawyers, admit that the Pope's temporal jurisdiction and his spiritual jurisdiction are global. When it comes to spirituals and morals, he is the chief of the world. There's your global Vatican. It continues, he says, he is the one sovereign and all other sovereigns can claim only those prerogatives and exercise only those powers which are compatible with the supreme, the all-comprehending and divine sovereignty of the pontiff. In other words, you cannot ascend to a position of power in this world as a king or a potentate or a queen or a president unless you agree to obey the Roman pontiff. 
and impose his law to the extent possible, to the extent as dictated by the sovereign of sovereigns, the Pope. And if at any time you decide to make war against that rightful sovereign divine throne in Rome, then you are deposed. A ruler's power comes from the Pope and it returns to the Pope. That's what is stated in Roman Catholic canon law. All power, all power, both spiritual and temporal, is manifest only in the breast of the Pope. If you have spiritual power, if you have temporal power in the world, you get it from the Pope. And he can take it from you at any time, just as if he were God on earth. Now, canon law saith expressly, quote, The constitutions of princes are not superior to ecclesiastical constitutions, but subordinate to them. Okay? The constitutions of states, that is the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of Britain, are not superior to Roman Catholic canon law. They are inferior and subordinate to Roman Catholic canon law. That means Roman Catholic canon law, <clears throat> through the power of the Pope, can abolish any and all constitutions whenever it becomes convenient for the Pope. Are we having trouble with our Constitution today? Is it being eroded? May we even suggest that it may be the Pope behind the erosion of our Constitution and civil liberties? It's a fact. As difficult as it may be to believe, it is a fact. And it says, Roman Catholic canon law says still more plainly, quote, the emperor ought to obey, not to command the pope, unquote. So the pope is sovereign. He doesn't take orders from any and all of the kings of the earth, no matter how many they, that line up against him. The pope is irresponsible to any human power or any collection of human powers. It says, as the power of a chieftain over his clan is necessarily regulated by the paramount jurisdiction of the sovereign who can absolve them from their obligation of feudal service to their immediate superior, so canon law gives consistently to the pope an analogous power. In other words, if a king becomes rebellious, a, 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 uh, a potentate over his clans becomes rebellious, then, he can, then the pope can order the heads of the clans to rebel against the king, the chieftain. <clears throat> and we've seen this repeatedly throughout history where a king or a queen or a potentate begins to rebel against the Pope's power and to begin to rebel against Roman Catholic canon law and to, in a sense, declare war against the papacy, then the papacy just issues an interdict which closes down all of the churches. Okay? And now the people cannot get married. They cannot have a Christian burial. They cannot participate in the sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church, the Mass. They can't bequeath their wills without a priest being present. They can't confess their sins. And if the Pope further exercises his power, he can say, if you do not rise up against your rebellious king and depose him in my name, you will be ipso facto excommunicated from the church and suffer the flames of eternal hell. Now, if you're like me, you just poo-poo that as the, the, the rantings of a Luciferian lunatic. But if you're a papist, or in our case today, an ecumenical evangelibelly who is becoming Catholic by the day, 
who has agreed to join this ecumenical movement to unite all the Christian faiths under the Roman pontiff, then you're going to darn well do what the Pope issues you to do. And if that means to overthrow the government, that's... And let me tell you, if the government of the United States is ever overthrown, it will be because the Pope ordered it to be overthrown. Because there's not enough Protestantism left in the world to overthrow anything. To the great delight of Rome, the man of sin, the son of perdition. It's Christ himself who's going to have to overthrow that diabolical throne in Rome. And all we can do is hang our heads in shame for forgetting our Protestant heritage. Now many accuse me of being hateful. I don't hate. Because I tell you the truth, have I become your enemy? This is the saddest state of affairs for Protestantism. The papacy no longer fears Bible-believing Protestants because they don't put their faith into practice. They don't oppose the Pope anymore. They don't call him what he is, the Antichrist, nor his church, the synagogue of Satan. And by all attestation, it's a Christian society. Roman Catholicism is some denomination, strange as it may be, wicked as it may be in the priest-pedophile pandemic and all the other bank scandals of the, of, the, of the Vatican, it's still a denomination of Christianity. Where's the fight in that? There isn't any. Roman Catholic canon law saith expressly, the constitutions of princes are not superior to ecclesiastical constitutions, but subordinate to them. And still further, quote, the emperor, that is the king of every land, it ought to obey and not command the pope, unquote. As the power of a chieftain over his clan is necessarily regulated by the paramount jurisdiction of the sovereign, who can absolve them from their obligation of feudal service to their immediate superior, so canon law gives consistently to the Pope an analogous power. He can overthrow kings because he commands the people. And if he says overthrow your king or go to hell, that's what the people will do. Now, the Bishop of Rome, it says, according to canon law, quote, may excommunicate emperors and princes, depose them from their states, and assoil their subjects from their oath of obedience to them, unquote. unquote. Okay, so you see, here we have in plain English what we've been describing. The Pope has the power to raise up the people against their governments. Now it says, in Reifenstuhl's textbook on canon law, published at Rome in 1831, it stated, quote, The Pope, as vicar of Christ on earth, and universal pastor of his sheep, that is, every man, woman, and child on the planet, has indirectly a certain supreme power for the good estate of the church, if it is necessary, of judging and deposing of all all the temporal goods of all Christians. Okay? He's the judge of the world. He not only judges, but he disposes of all temporal goods of all Christians. He can take away your goods. All of them. There, are n there is nothing that you call yours that the Pope cannot take away from you, according to Roman Catholic canon law, when he finds it advantageous to the papacy and to the Roman Catholic Church. And temporal goods includes it, intangible things, like liberty, 
freedom. Your freedom of speech. Your freedom of religion. Your freedom of conscience. Your freedom to keep and bear arms. These are all temporal goods as opposed to spiritual. So we're not talking about just tangible things. Your house, your car, your kids. We're talking about intangible temporal goods as well. Liberty. Peace. Yes, he has the power to take peace from the earth and subject you to war. That's the power of the papacy, according to Roman Catholic canon law. Now he says this is very plain, that the popes understand canon law in its literal meaning as conferred upon them a most comprehensive total jurisdiction the whole history of Europe since the 10th century testifies. Okay? This is the way it's been since the turn of the first millennium. The first millennium, the, Pope, the papacy rose in power, and it has exercised it fully since the 10th century, except for a brief period of time at the time of the Protestant Reformation and the French Revolution. Now, those both being dead, as at least I perceive it, the Pope's now free to rebuild the kingdom over which he ruled prior to the Protestant Reformation and the French Revolution. And it's called, the, they just simply call it the New World Order. It's not new at all. I know I'm repeating it myself, but <laughs> I find <laughs> through so many years of experience it's necessary. He has the power of judging. Roman Catholic canon law stipulates that the Pope is the judge of every man, and no man may judge him. And he is the disposer of all temporal goods of all Christians. If you live in the Western Hemisphere, then you are considered a Christian, whether you are or not, that the Pope doesn't care. If he claims the Western Hemisphere is a Christian hemisphere, then he has claimed himself to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the Western Hemisphere, and he judges and he deposes and he disposes all temporal goods. So he literally is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the Christian world. And all there is left for him to do is to conquer the rest of the world so that the whole world is Christian which literally means subject to the Roman pontiff, has nothing to do with religion, sorry to say. And there you have your global Vatican, which Francis Rooney told us about in the previous book. So it's starting to make sense? It's not hard to understand once you get the elemental basics. And the basic of basics is Roman Catholic canon law. Once you understand what Roman Catholic canon law stipulates, then you fully understand the intent and purpose of the Pope in the world, the Antichrist of the Bible. Now he says, what then does canon law mean as applied to Great Britain? It means in the first place the transference of the sovereignty of Britain from Queen Victoria to the Roman Pontiff. Okay, The Roman Pontiff... Not the queen, not the parliament, not the people. The Roman pontiff becomes the sovereign of sovereigns in Great Britain. It means in the second place that the right of parliament to legislate, the right of parliament to legislate, unless in complete subserviency to every requirement of canon law, shall cease and desist. It means that the priest shall not be amenable to the civil tribunals. You can't lay a charge against a priest of the Roman Catholic Church and expect him to stand trial in a civil trial. He is above the civil authority. It says, and that when accused of treason or of murder or of any crime whatever, the ecclesiastical, the ecclesiastical courts only shall have power to try them. You get the picture? That's why the pedophile priests never go to jail. We'll be back right after this. Inquisition update on First Amendment Radio.
Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors it. If you wish to contact me, please do so by email. My email address is tom at seawaves.us. Canon law. That's the subject of this morning's reading and discussion. Roman Catholic canon law and the authority, the supreme, irresponsible sovereignty of the Pope as the global King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What consequence does the erection of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in Great Britain in 1865 have for Great Britain? What does Roman Catholic canon law hold in consequence for Great Britain? He says, what then does canon law mean as applied to Great Britain? It means in the first place the transference of the sovereignty of Britain from Queen Victoria to the Roman pontiff. Okay, the popes, the queen, of the king, and the parliament. It says it means in the second place that the right of parliament to legislate, unless in complete subserviency to every requirement of canon law, shall cease and determine, or cease and desist. Cease to practice, unless it is completely subservient to Roman Catholic canon law. What does it mean for the United States that Barack Obama can remain president of the United States if he is completely subservient to the papacy? And Congress can regularly meet in session so long as it is subservient and held subordinate and corrected by Roman Catholic canon law. It's all a show. If legislation comes to the par- to the, the American Parliament, Congress, and it's subservient to Roman Catholic canon law, then it's passed. If it's not, it's defeated. No one ever tells you that it's a canonical debate, but it is. And what few Protestants there may remain in, in the American Parliament, Congress, they lose the battle. And if perchance a Protestant piece of legislation is passed, it's not enforced. So it's just a public show of national sovereignty. There is no national sovereignty. The Pope rules supreme. Or he can order the people to overthrow the government. Okay? It says in the second place that the right of Parliament to legislate unless in complete subserviency to every requirement of canon law shall cease and desist. It means that priests, Roman Catholic priests, shall not be amenable to civil tribunals. In other words, you can't take them to court. They're immune, perpetually immune, because they come under the direct jurisdiction of the papacy. And there's no higher court than the Pope's ecclesiastical courts. Okay? He says in that when accused of treason or of murder of, or of any other crime, whatever, the ecclesiastical courts only shall have power to try the priests. Okay? This is a case of the fox watching the hen house. The fox in Rome watches all of his little hens, his little bishops and cardinals and priests all over the world, and if one of them gets in trouble, rapes a little boy, sodomizes a little boy, he is held under the jurisdiction of the church. The church courts, not the civil courts. Now you say, but but Tom, come on now. You're denying the, the obvious that there have been courts, civil courts, assembled in this country to try and convict some of these pedophile priests. Granted, there have, but that's only by permission of the Pope. You see, when word comes to the Pope that he's got a renegade bishop or priest or cardinal that is caught repeatedly sodomizing little boys, and it is gotten in the mainstream media and spread 
far and wide, the Pope goes into his calculation mode. He gets out his little calculus calculator and tries to determine cost-benefit. What will be the cost to the Roman Catholic Church if this pedophile is not taken into the civil courts and tried publicly? Or what benefit will it be if the Pope is if, if the Pope allows this priest to be convicted? And only by the say of the Pope can a civil court proceed against a priest after that calculus is done. So if it's more damaging to the Roman Catholic Church to have this priest go free than it would be for this priest to be com convicted in a civil court and spend time in jail, then that's what happens. And if after a public conviction and the, the, the public mind is satisfied that justice has been served, at any time the Pope can spring the priest from jail. And if nothing else, bring him to Rome and put him up in the Vatican, in the Pope's castle, on the hill, Vatican Hill. And such was the case with cardinal law. There's an example in my experience, my direct experience on amateur radio. There is a Roman Catholic retired police detector who has singled me out for persecution on ham radio. And, of course, he has to gain credibility with everyone else on ham radio so that he might get by with this persecution against me. So he boasts uh, about his Roman Catholicism, but that Inquisition update, or Tom Fress, is a liar because I arrested, he says, a Roman Catholic priest for embezzling some $93,000 from the Roman Catholic Church. You see, I've told everybody that no arrest, no civil authority, whether it be the police or a private detective or anybody else can cross the threshold of a Roman Catholic Church, much less arrest a priest, much less bring him to trial, without the permission of the Pope through the bishop the local bishop. So in other words, for this amateur radio operator who claims to be a retired police detective to arrest a priest, he had to have gotten permission. His superior, his police chief, had to have gotten permission from the local bishop. Even for embezzlement of some $93,000 from the Roman Catholic Church. So he's got his image splattered all over YouTube as having, convict, having helped to convict a, an embezzling priest. Well, he's got all kinds of credibility in the amateur radio community in his persecution against me. But I maintain that that retired police detective would never have had the power to arrest that priest were it not for the permission granted by the Pope and issued to his police chief through the bishop of that local bishopric, that local jurisdiction. And that the arrest of that priest was most likely to protect the priest from the reason that he embezzled $93,000 from the church, and that is to pay off all the little boys who were prepared to make accusation of pedophilia. And that this Roman Catholic retired police detective arrested that priest to save him from going to from destroying the church in that local jurisdiction from the accusation and the conviction of repeated acts of pedophilia by this priest so he was led into the civil courts tried and convicted of embezzling 93,000 and he shuffled off to some resort somewhere to be reformed when he should be hung for serially sodomizing innocent little boys. And the very retired police detective, who now is the legitimate critic of Tom Fress on, in, on amateur radio, 
is a complicit is is complicit in allowing a pedophile to go free. And I am the one who was persecuted. I am the one who was criticized. But the civil courts have no jurisdiction either over an embezzling priest or of a sodomizing priest unless it is given permission to arrest that priest by the local bishop and ultimately by the Pope. That's the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. It's as old as the Roman Catholic Church itself. And as I've said many times on the program, the ecumenical councils of the Roman Catholic Church throughout history, after the official public debates have had to retire to private session to deal with the common, perpetual, everlasting scourge of the priesthood. Because they are idolaters, they are also sodomites. And for as long as the idolatrous Church of Rome has existed, her priests have been sodomites and pedophiles. And as long as they can, con they can contain the damage within the church itself, it lives peaceably with it. But when it becomes public, the Pope is forced to act. Not out of charity and love and concern for the victims of these priests, but out of love, concern, and charity for his own institution. And when given an opportunity, even when the church goes into damage control and allows one of these priests to be con tried and convicted in a civil court, behind the scenes, it treats its victims like the, like the perpetrators themselves, having brought false accusations, they say, against the church, and are just money grubbers trying to deplete the church of its wealth. That's how the system works. That's how it's always worked, and that's how it's always going to work. So the retired police detector, detective is no hero. He will be tried and convicted with all the other papists in the world for their crimes. And I'll suffer the persecution until that day takes place. Okay? Canon law stipulates that the priest shall not be amenable to the civil tribunals, the civil courts, and that when accused of treason or murder or any crime whatever, especially pedophilia and embezzlement, do you know why a priest embezzles money from the Roman Catholic Church? One of two reasons. He is either taking church resources to help support his secret wife or his bastard children. The celibate priest goes off and secretly gets married to a woman. She conceives and brings forth children, and somehow his conscience causes him to provide for their needs. And so he steals from the church, having no other source of income. Unless, of course, he's peddling drugs on the side. So the church loses millions all right, there's a second case where a priest will steal from the, from the coffers of the church. That's to silence their victims. To silence little boys who eventually grow to become men who are tormented day and night, year in, year out, for what has happened to them when they were the most vulnerable and the most trusting of the priest. They sooner or later grow up to be men and they want to resolve their pain and clear their conscience. And so they come forward with grotesque stories. And to shut them up, the priest embezzles from the church. Those are the two reasons why a priest steals money from the church to support his wife and his progeny, and to silence his victims. And the Pope says the civil courts have no 
jurisdiction, no more than they would have jurisdiction over Christ's and his altar Christos, the priests. No jurisdiction over the Pope, no authority over the Pope nor his priests. If they are ever to be tried, they are to be tried in the ecclesiastical courts, the church courts. Never is it to be talked about in the press. Never is it under civil observation. Okay? That which is carnal is carnal, that which is spiritual is spiritual, and they shall never mix, according to Roman Catholic canon law. The priest is a spiritual extension of the Pope, and no more than you can try the Pope in a civil court, you can't try a priest, unless the Pope gives permission as a means of damage control. I hope I've made the point. All right, Roman Catholic canon law means that the Pope shall be entitled to appoint to every ecclesiastical living in the country. There's your, your uh, what, what's the term they used? Um, investiture. Okay? He is the one who picks the priests and the cardinals and the hierarchy. Only the Pope, not the Queen, not the Parliament, nobody else. We're talking about a divine society, not an earthly, mortal society. So only the divine can appoint the priests. Only the Pope can appoint the priests. Now, if a nation rebels, such as China, and insists that if anybody's going to be a bishop in China, the hierarchy of China is going to pick that bishop, then the Pope has to resort to ulterior means to defeat that system and to install all of the, the stars of heaven in China. That's what's going on between the Vatican and China. It was even admitted so in the Global Vatican by Francis Rooney. So the Roman Catholic Church is split in two in China. Those who obey the, 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 the civil government in China and allow the president of China to appoint the bishops. And then the Roman Catholic Church, where the Pope only appoints the bishops. So China has within itself another nation, another government, another God, just like the United States does. And since the United States has fallen, fallen, and fallen to papal control, so will China. And that's why China is being raised to a world power now. That's why our influence, that's why our, our money, that's why our debt has been passed on to China. Our, our goods, and, our, our goods and, and services are now provided by China. Our industries have been shipped to China. The Pope has granted his blessing to China. He has dispensed with the goods of this heretical nation, the United States of America, as punishment. It's just not Catholic enough. It's not moving to Rome fast enough. The Pope has, well, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy to consider, and uh, China factors in. So China has to have the means by which to fulfill certain Bible prophecies. And, of course, as long as the Pope is orchestrating the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, then Bible, then Bible prophecy must be indicating that the Pope will eventually be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the whole world, and not just Rome and Europe and America. Maybe I'm talking too fast, but you get the drift. The Pope really does control the kings of the earth. He really does shake the whole earth. And that's why so much of the world obeys him. Completely deceived. Hopelessly deceived. Except for the grace and the mercy of God Almighty through Jesus Christ. The only hope for the world is to pick up the King James Bible and read it and understand it. That's the only hope for the world. Okay, canon law, it means that the Pope shall be entitled to appoint to every ecclesiastical living in the country. 
Okay? The Pope has sole jurisdiction over the religious hierarchy. No one else can influence the religious hierarchy. Only the Pope. And that means your ecumenical evangelical belly pastor. You know, the one who never tells you all of this stuff? He must take his orders from the Pope through the local bishop or through the local general conference of the particular denomination who, who ultimately is controlled by the papacy through the World Council of Churches or the National Council of Churches or any other so-called council. Christ is not their king. The Pope is. And that's why they keep all this stuff secret to you. If you understood it, you would run from the churches. If you love Christ, you would naturally repel Antichrist or remove yourself from his influence. But the church survives on a public face, a public reputation. It would suffer harm if everybody left the churches, so they strike a balance. Pretenders to love Christ when in fact they serve Antichrist. Just like the religious leaders of Israel's day, when Christ walked the face of, of walked the streets of Jerusalem, the religious hierarchy are the ones that Christ condemned. A generation of vipers, he called them. He would do likewise today. It means the restoration of the church lands. A, to the very last acre. That's what the imposition of Roman Catholic canon law in Great Britain represented. The return or the restoration of every acre of Great Britain once owned by the church. And I, I'd be repetitious if I went on to tell you that prior to the Protestant Reformation, the Pope controlled over a third of Great Britain. He owned it. It was his land. He, gave, he, gave, he gained the, uh, the produce from it. It was all there to support the church and to pay the endowments of the priests, the livings of the priests. There was nothing left for the people. Great Britain was starving. England was starving. Until Henry VIII. Catholic though he was till his death, he rebelled against the papacy and liberated the land of England from the Pope and gave it back to the people. And that's how prosperity came to England eventually. Until then, it was starving to death. Well, the, the installation of the hierarchy, the imposition of Roman Catholic canon law means the restoration of every acre of ground that was quote-unquote stolen from the Pope by Henry VIII. That's what it means. And, of course, for the United States, it means, well, <laughs> it was Rome's to begin with, according to the donation of Constantine. And so the Pope is a legitimate owner, and we are just tenants on the land. That's why you never own your home. The Pope maintains through the civil power a prior claim, a prior mortgage to your property. That's why they're able to tax you on it. That's where your property taxes come from. Were it not for the power of the Pope and the ownership of the land the government would have no jurisdiction to tax you for your land. It's just Peter's pence is all it is. Yes, it goes to the government. The government redistributes that wealth, but it does so because the power of the government comes from the breast of the papacy. It has no power on its own. And the moment it rebels against the papacy it loses its power, or whatever so much power that the papacy decides to take from it. And if the government won't relinquish that power and seeks to benefit from its own power instead of benefiting the papacy, 
Well, the papacy just claims uh, proclaims an interdict and overthrows the government through the people. That's why I say if the government of this country is ever th overthrown, it won't be by God's people. It will be by the Pope himself. It will be by the people who follow the Pope's lead. It's a hideous reality, but a reality nonetheless. We're all, we're all made subject of the Roman Pontiff by our own government. It's not a Christian country. It's an Antichrist country. I'll see you tomorrow.